This is Marshall Goldsmith. Welcome, welcome to LinkedIn Live. Welcome to LinkedIn Live. So happy to be here with my great friends from Methods. They do fantastic work for learning online in today's crazy times. So a wonderful organization, Methods, is working with us and our partner, Thinkers50, number one organizations for ranking and management thinkers. Now, we're going to have a wonderful show today. Let me briefly introduce myself, and then we'll talk about our wonderful guest today. Uh, my name is Marshall. I'm from Kentucky. I went to school in Indiana, got a PhD at UCLA. I was a college professor and dean when I was young. And then I've done three predominant things, travel around the world speaking and teaching, and I've been to 102 countries, and on the American Airlines, I have over 11 million frequent flyer miles. And one thing I love about our LinkedIn calls, we have people from all around the world. I'm amazed how many countries are represented on these calls. We have sometimes people from 30, 40 different countries. So that's wonderful. Then I write and edit books and articles. I've written or edited, uh, I think I've written or edited 41 books. I've done six big selling books. And uh, one of them with my good friend who's here today, Sally Helgeson. Then I uh, coach executives. I've been a coach of the CEO of Ford and Pfizer and Glaxo and World Bank and Mayo Clinic and uh, other wonderful people. And that's where I learned everything from all these great people I coach. And then finally, I came up with this idea of give back all I know to people. And the only price is I get old, they do the same thing. I thought 100 people might be interested. It turned out 18,000 people applied. And we have this wonderful group called 100 Coaches. And two of the wonderful, spectacular members are today. A lot of just amazing leaders, thinkers, athletes, all kinds of people from around the world. So today, what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about inclusive leadership, inclusive leadership in today's challenging times. Oh, and one thing, I always forget this, ask questions. So if you can write down your questions there in the, in the chat box, and then Justin will be able to read us questions so you can ask my two guests, Sally and Jeff, any questions you might have. So first, let me introduce my two good comrades. The first one is Sally Helgeson. Sally is a wonderful friend of mine. We've known, How many years have we known each other, Sally? 26, Marshall. 26 years. 26. We've known each other 26 years. And we're still speaking, which is an amazing thing. <laughs> <laughs> so we've known each other 26 years. Sally is the number one expert on women and leadership in the world. She's an outstanding coach. She's an author, and she's done many books on her own. She did one book with me called How Women Rise. That book is spectacularly well-written. Why can I say that book is well-written? I did not write the book. Sally actually wrote the book. I, I made a minor contribution. She's the lead author to the book. It is a, it's a spectacular book, though. I love the book. And also, she's a great speaker. So she travels all around the world talking about women's issues, inclusive leadership. So, Sally, thank you for joining us. <coughs> oh, it's wonderful to be here, Marshall. I always enjoy these so much. Yes, and our other comrade is Jeff Hall, a new member of our fine 
uh, MG100 group. He's a writer. He's a clinical psychologist, executive coach. He's been a director of education at the Harvard Institute of Coaching, where he works with another one of her great comrades, Carol Kaufman. So, Jeff, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, wonderful. Now, I'll ask you a question for Sally and Jeff. Jeff, you can go first. Uh, how is the current situation we're in changing the role of leaders? Well, I think that uh, it's pretty obvious to everyone that the kinds of things that we were doing before the pandemic hit were already in disruption, were already changing and evolving. And if anything, the situation we're facing, the challenges today are just accelerating the need for greater inclusion, the, the need for greater agility. So uh, it's really putting everybody back on their heels in terms of ha having to look at new ways of operating and reflecting on the ways they've operated in the past and breaking apart old patterns and trying out new things because the old way just isn't gonna work anymore. You know, Sally, you'll appreciate this. Uh, speaking of learning new things, I'm now learning video editing, which is, you know, God, wow. who would have thought that might happen? But, I mean, you know, you never know. You never know. So, you know, always be trying new and different things. So I think that's all good news. Sally, what's your response? How is this world of leadership changing? You know, the biggest thing I see is people getting more real. I see people getting more real. It's hard to hold everything together and look like the super professional, responsible person who shows up every day with your persona intact. Uh, I think it's harder to do that. And what I see is people acknowledging that. I was talking to a woman the other day who is a sales manager for a giant communications company. And she said when they had their Zoom meeting, her, uh, the head of her division, she said, who's always been a very, you know, straight laced, buttoned down type of guy, um, started the meeting by talking about how tough this was for him. And I think that's really interesting that we're almost being forced to bring our humanity to work with us and that that can serve many things. It can serve uh, inclusion, it can serve honesty, it can ser serve trust. Um, and it certainly serves communication. So uh, on the plus side, I'm really seeing that people more comfortable being real. Yeah, I think so too. I don't I, I think that something somehow death brings in the humanity in all of us. It's concept, <laughs> oh, yeah, people are dying here. Yeah, it sort of puts everything in a little perspective there. You know, yeah, we're, yeah, we're all gonna be equally dead here. So I put on some show. You know, uh, the next question is, how about inclusion? Uh, Sally, you go first. Why is inclusion more important today than ever in your mind? Well, it, one of the reasons it's it's so important uh, these days is we're not together. You know, we're separate and it's harder for people to feel seen and noticed. Um, one of the things in working, I've been working and you know, I wrote a book called The Web of Inclusion, A New Architecture for Building uh, Great Organizations, published 1995. It was the first time the language of inclusion was used in a business context. This was before diversity and inclusion got paired. But what it's been a very powerful pairing, I think. And one of the reasons it makes sense is that people who uh, uh, come from very diverse backgrounds or women, minorities, African-Americans, Latinas, um, et cetera, uh, people with you know different sexualities, all have a, diff a more difficult time feeling included so that organizations and leaders need to think about what kind of inclusive behaviors can I demonstrate that will convey to people that they are recognized not just for their contributions, but for their potential which is often how, how people who come from outside the, the traditional you know, white male leader 
are um, uh, they they feel they're not seen for their potential. So this is a tough time for that because we're not actually together. And we have all this mediation through technology. So I think it's a particularly important opportunity for leaders to find ways, given that mediation and given, given that people are feeling somewhat isolated and alone, to be able to convey that message. I think it's both a great opportunity to do it and it's a tougher environment to do it in. So we need to be more creative about how we demonstrate mm -hmm. inclusive behaviors. You know, Sally, there's a good country song. I was country when country wasn't <laughs> cool. Well, you were inclusive. I very well. When it wasn't cool. <laughs> <laughs> so Sally was a pioneer in inclusion before inclusion was cool. Jeff, <laughs> great to talk, Sally, Jeff. But, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Why is inclusion being inclusive more important than ever? Well, I totally agree with everything Sally was saying. And I um, I use her book, your book, in a number of the workshops that I'm doing with teams these days, even online, looking at the ways that uh, women and minorities hold themselves back or have been held back. And like Sally, though, I think that there is an opportunity or a silver lining in the situation that we're facing because so many of the, I would call them the walls or the silos have kind of come down and we're all having to be more real with each other these days. And so there's an opportunity for us to break apart some of those traditional patterns. I mean, the most obvious one is work and life, right? For, for most of us that are working at home, life has intruded on work. And so the balance, these, these false walls or dichotomies between work life, between other categories like uh, millennials and boomers, I sometimes think that the distinctions we make between even masculine and feminine are actually rather arbitrary. Um, recently, scientists demonstrated that there's no difference. There's no such thing as the left brain and the right brain. And you know, if you think about this opportunity that we have where we're all kind of going through the same thing all around the planet, it's an opportunity to kind of break down and rethink some of the ways that we've separated, whether it's functional silos or distinctions between male leadership and female leadership or um, uh, walls of approvals, you know, hierarchical walls of who gets to speak and who doesn't get to speak. When we're all on a Zoom call, you know, my friend the other day that I was I was on a call around inclusion with my friend Jennifer Brown, who's an expert in that space, and she was talking about, you know, when we all come back to work, that we will be sitting around the conference table and hopefully we will be connecting in new ways and the power dynamic will have shifted to be more inclusive and less hierarchical. And I shared with her, you know, my my vision is actually there is no conference table. There, just like when, when you're on a Zoom call, everybody's equal. Everybody's in their little box. There's no hierarchy. So there's an opportunity to potentially be together in new ways. And that creates an opening for leaders to explore and experiment and listen to their teams mm -hmm. with a much more compassionate, open-hearted approach. I, I like that. And, you know, before I get into a question on specifically women's issues for Sally, you know, Sally, I like this idea of just kind of relax and be yourself. You know what I've decided in the future? I'm just going to wear a green T-shirt every day. Oh, what a great idea, Marshall. But what about your branding? <laughs> I'm sorry, I've been to your house and I've been to I've seen the entire closet filled with green uh, with green polo shirts. So uh, I don't think that's much of a shift for you. <laughs> not much of a shift. You know, Sally, we did a wonderful book called How Women Rise Together. I love that book, by yeah. the way. And it was such a joy to work with you. And Sally and I, not often, occasionally we get to present together. By the way, we're, we're lucky we're both not dead because we bought their presentation in San Francisco just when his crisis was kicking off, we were hugging people and shaking hands, you know, uh, stupid, stupid. Uh, anyway, fortunately, neither one of them seemed to die. So that's a very good thing. If you look at challenges for women today, 
What's just one specifically for women you think might pop in your mind, Sally? Well, one thing I see is certainly women who have children and who especially who have school age children and now they're doing the homeschooling thing. Um, that is really, really tough to manage with work. This it's it's extraordinary. Yes, men are stepping up more than they have probably in the past in terms of taking responsibility. Guess what? Because they're home, uh, but it is a huge responsibility that that falls on on women. And this is all over the world. Yesterday, I had a call with colleagues in Dubai, and they told me Dubai has now announced that they won't be opening schools until uh, mid January 2021. And the one woman went like that. She's she's got three children at home, so she's homeschooling and a very demanding uh, job. So I think that's one of the things that we've seen, especially women who have children at home, really, really dealing with. On the other hand, um, I think it's fascinating that one of the big challenges, one of the structural challenges and how women rise, we deal with the internal barriers that hold women back as they seek to move forward in organizations and achieve their full potential, but there are also structural and cultural barriers that have traditionally held women back. And the big structural barrier has been this rigid divide, to use Jeff's language, between work and home. And that divide has been eroded in this crisis. And I'm not confident that it's going to go back to being the way it was. Um, I was talking with a client uh, who's at an energy company, a global energy company, and she said, you know, we've always been very conservative uh, at this company, and our leadership has been extremely skeptical of any work from home. She said, and this has held us back in terms of attracting and retaining women. She said, but she said, now they really see it works. We're not having um, impact on productivity and they see all the possibilities. She said, I just don't think that we're gonna go back to having that rigid office structure that we had before. And as I think I pointed out to you, Marshall, the CEO of Tata, which is one of the largest conglomerations in the world, said that he right. anticipates after that, that they'll have three quarters of their workforce will be um, virtual. So I think that's going to be a you know, very big plus for women, especially because once the schools open again, you know, it's going to get a lot easier. You know, it's interesting, Sally. I never thought about this, but I was brought up. My dad had a little gas station, a little truck stop. And, you know, I, the house was next door. So I was kind of brought up there. And, you know, the idea of the business and watching my parents in the business was just part of life. And I think actually it was very helpful for me. I mean, I learned some things about business that they didn't teach at Harvard Business School. You know, like you add up the money, you pay off, you keep what's left, you know, overhead. I learned a lot of stuff just hanging around my parents. And now I'm watching, you know, Sally, you know, my daughter Kelly, who was, by the way, uh, this week uh, won the award as the number one uh, professor at the Vanderbilt College of Business there. I will drop that in today, my daughter Kelly. Kelly. She, she was the number one <laughs> I'm bragging, of course, and I had to reach for some excuse to drop that in the conversation, but I did. So anyway, Kelly, okay. I noticed the kid, well, my grandkids, I noticed them, you know, lurking around, they're watching what she's doing she's teaching classes while they're kind of paying attention. And, you know, so I think it is kind of neat for kids to see their parents are just humans and, you know, their parents working and she's trying to set up videos and she's trying to learn all this crazy stuff in the same way I am. So I think it could be some really, really interesting and different dynamics on the, the family front. Now, Jeff, I there's a term too. you yeah. called agility muscle. I never heard that phrase before, building your agility muscle. What does that mean? Well, uh, before, before I speak to that, I just want to make a comment about what uh, Sally was speaking about with international groups. Because, you know, one of the reasons that I started working with her book, with your book, I say her book, but it's actually both of you, 
is that in my book, I talk a lot about the cultural diversity that's happening in teams all around the world that we're already, in fact, working virtually in many ways. And so many of the tips that you give in that book are applicable not just to women, but of people of different cultures. So I had already started using it with folks from different Asian cultures that are more hierarchical. So it, all the tips like the tendency to minimize or the tendency to be um, focused on your, your perfectionism as opposed to your career, there's a number of them, are really applicable across cultures and across diverse uh, populations, not just women. And I think that that, um, that creates an opportunity for us to support women, but also other minorities and all different people from different cultures. I, I can coach my white male, more authoritarian leaders, more authoritative leaders to use cultural humility during this time, to be curious and learn. This is a great opportunity to learn about different cultures. So I just want to mention that because I think it's directly connected to what, what Sally was saying about um, the cultural diversity in some of her groups that she's working with, not just women. The agility muscle, I think it's, it's interesting. I was already on Before we get to that agility muscle, I just had a a mental thought about diversity that I think this is great. This new world has done a good job. Historically, there has been some discrimination against younger people. You know, they're not as experienced, they're not as smart, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, you know and, and some sort of the fact that, you know, somehow because you're older, you're supposed to be smarter or some nonsense. And I think one good thing about the new world, especially with the advent of everyone having to use technology, like me learning, um, learning how to do video editing, you know, is it really does produce, number one, more appreciation for younger people, because most of them know far more about all of this technology stuff than I do. And, and then a sense that of humility, because you realize, hey, they know more than me, it's okay. It's okay. So I think this is another type of inclusion, including people that are younger, and really, being they're more equal because especially in the world of technology new technology video conferencing they typically know more than old people anyway so i think that's been another really positive movement toward inclusion i never thought about until this conversation now again my apologies for interrupting agility muscle well, you're going to talk about that agility muscle building our agility muscle <laughs> Yeah, and actually I'd love to use that opportunity to connect the two dots because when you mention the younger folks and the possibility of learning from them, you know, that's an opportunity for us to break down that kind of false dichotomy we have between all the different demographics like boomers and millennials and generation X and all that. I mean, sure there are differences, really. Obviously generational divides are real. But on the other hand, this situation that we're in creates an opportunity for our leaders that we coach. Uh -oh. Sally, can you hear Jeff? Yeah, I can't hear Jeff. Uh, maybe we should talk for a moment till he comes back. No, we we'll keep going. Jeff disappeared. His, Jeff his agility died. muscle disappeared. <laughs> His ability may get him back in. Yeah, I agree. You know, Marshall, I love this conversation. I love this conversation. And I think, you know, where, where Jeff was going with that is that, you know, that idea that this sort of cultural humility enables leaders to be more agile, uh, more flexible, and that it works to the good of all. But I wanted to make a point. I thought it was really interesting what you were talking about, about that, you know, the gas station you, you grew up was right next to your home and you saw your parents um, running a business together. And I think I have a feeling that what this environment is going to return us to, because it's going to go on for a while, that what we're going to see uh, is a return to a more you know, almost pre-industrial way of people structuring work and home and where couples and families will really be working together. I've talked to so many people who've had their children who have been helping them to adjust to 
the technological requirements of, of showing up today. Lots of people that I've talked to. Um, I've had people who are have their grandchildren at home and are using seven and eight year olds to help them do things like video editing um, because they understand those skills so much more. So I think that idea of, of cultural humility and breaking down barriers is going to be one of the uh, silver linings or positive takeaways from what we're going through right now. Um, not to put too Pollyanna-ish a uh, picture on it, there's a lot of pain out there. But um, but looking forward, I think that some of those things, that more family solidarity rather than having, you know, mom has this life and dad has this life and the kids have this life, you know, it gets more blended. And I think that that can be very healthy. You know, like our 100 coach organization, I see is parallel to that in a way. It's kind of more like a family almost, like a community. We all kind of pitch in. Everybody's friends. And so it's not quite so stuffy and formal. Justin, are there uh, questions there for our wonderful guest, Sally or Jeff, that you would like to ask? There are many, many questions today, Marshall. Hello, Sally. Welcome back, Jeff. Uh, glad to have you back with us. In fact, uh, Friedberg has been commenting and active on the stream today, and she's from New York. She, she wanted to call you out specifically, Jeff. Uh, she said that insightful point about everyone being equal on a Zoom call and there really being no hierarchy. She said it's an excellent distinction. Um, after all, we're all equally vulnerable with the virus. So speaking of New York, we've got people calling in from writing from Florida, Texas, Illinois, Sweden, Sweden, Turkey, Guatemala, Brazil, Mexico, England, Saudi Arabia, India. And what we'll do is we'll go to our first question from India, from Mumbai, India. This is from Stalgai. Uh, and I don't know if I pronounced that right. So forgive me if I didn't. Uh, but Stalgai writes, will this disruption create more inclusion or will it create more power in the top positions? From my perspective, it'll do both. Uh, we'll see both. And there'll be, as always, there are conflicting trends. I believe that there's a possibility for much more con uh, inclusion because there's more equality. And we are all, as Marshall pointed out, equal before the possibility of imminent death and illness. Um, so I think that that serves that. Um, I do also think that the short term uh, extraordinary challenges of getting through this and the way that it is unequally impacting people in terms of income and financial fear and, in, and also in terms of who's getting uh, the virus. Um, I think that that also threatens to create and, and bolster some of the forces of inequality and exclusion that have been uh, growing in different parts of the world. Uh, can I can I add the the possibility or the optimistic view of the on that would be that maybe this situation <clears throat> will create a new opportunity to redefine power because whether it's from the top or somewhere else in the organization, what's powerful right now is actually emotional connection and compassion and listening and curiosity. That's what's causing people to feel motivated and inspired and not get depressed and not feel um, really down about the situation. And the, those that can express that kind of empathy, vulnerability, connection, listening, they are gonna hold the power, whether they're at the top or somewhere else in the organization. Good. It's such a great point, Jeff. Fantastic. Yeah, how about, uh... How about Justin? Do we have time for one more question? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so uh, Marshall, this one comes from, uh, and this uh, I'm going to direct this one at you initially, and you can tech, uh, tell, ask whoever on the, the show to answer here. But Marshall, uh, Teddy Gamble asks, he's from Dallas, Texas, how do we encourage our managers and team to stay positive in light of the current situation with, with so many unknowns? Okay. First, uh, Peter Drucker taught me a great lesson. Sally's heard me say this many times. Every decision in life is made by the decision maker. If Sally is my manager and I need to make her more positive, I need to realize one thing. She's one word to describe her customer, one word to describe me, salesperson. She ain't got to buy, I got to sell. You sell what you can sell, you change what you can change. If you can sell it, you sell it, you change it, you change it. You can't sell it, you can't change it, you let it go. You do your best 
in a very positive way yourself to help her be more positive. And to the degree she is willing to listen and adapt, you can succeed. To the degree she doesn't care, you probably cannot succeed. In the same way with my coaching clients, I can really help people who are open and want to learn. If they're not, there's nothing I'm going to do about it. I've learned a hard lesson. My name is Marshall Goldsmith, not Jesus Christ. I can't make people change that don't want to change. Well, your boss, your boss wants to be a downer. Your boss is a downer. Now, let me give you some advice. Long-term, short-term. Long-term, if your boss continues to be a pain in the butt, get another job. Leave. Short-term, probably not a good time to be looking for another job. Hang around till this passes, then leave. So those are my two quick suggestions for you. Sally, anything else uh, in terms of, or Jeff, about making the boss a little more positive? Yeah, I think that what we can do is to be honest with bosses without with letting go the the uh, you know the expectation that they're necessarily going to listen to us. One of the things that I've heard the most from people in this crisis is our group is actually doing very well, but our leadership is uncomfortable. Uh, because they feel like their parameters can't always be met. You know, somebody they'll say, I, I need this report tonight. And somebody will say, that's fine. I've got four kids. I'm homeschooling. I can do it tomorrow morning. And, and the leader comes to the person, the manager, and says, you know, this is not acceptable and blah, blah, blah. So I think one of the things we can do is to be honest with leaders and say, you know, you 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 need to explore more what the circumstances people are operating, actually operating in right now. I think that this is a good time to be a truth teller, but let go of the result that just because you tell the truth doesn't mean, as you say, that that that, that boss is going to buy it. But I think in terms of being the salesperson for a point of view, that honesty is a really good policy right now. Very good. Well, you know, right now it's time to wrap up. Let me just wrap up and say, Jeff, thank you so much for joining our wonderful 100 Coaches group. Sally, thank you so much for being a good friend of mine for a godzillion years. And thanks to both of you. It's been my honor to work with both of you. Had a great time today. Loved, this, loved the topic. Loved talking with you. Thanks to everyone for listening in. Hopefully we did a little good for you out there. So see you later. Bye-bye. Thank you.